Welcome to our Bible study, the fourth lesson in this quarter. Uh, you may have tried to read the Bible uh, straight through at some point over a course of a year or a month or whatever. I once did it over the course of a couple of weeks. And if you got bogged down, there's a pretty good chance it was around the book of Leviticus. And we're going to jump right into Leviticus 1. And this may be exactly where you got bogged down, maybe even got discouraged and weren't able to continue because at first blush, this doesn't seem to have an awful lot of relevance to our lives. I'm going to read Leviticus 1, 1 through 9. The Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any of you bring an offering of livestock to the Lord, you shall bring your offering from the herd or from the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you shall offer a male without blemish. You shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting for acceptance in your behalf before the Lord. You shall lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be acceptable in your behalf as atonement for you. The bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer the blood, dashing the blood against all the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The burnt offering shall be flayed and cut up into parts. The sons of the priest of Aaron shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the parts with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire on the altar. But its entrails and its legs shall be washed with water. Then the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire as a pleasing odor to the Lord. And I want to say the word of God for the people of God. And you might want to say, I don't know if I want to say thanks be to God or not. But let's examine this passage and really think a little bit about the whole book of Leviticus as we move forward in this study. I once had a family in my church uh, who decided they wanted to give a gift of thanksgiving to God for all of the blessings that God had given to them. Uh, this was outside of their normal tithes and offerings. They simply felt led to give this gift. And part of what they wanted to do was to give a gift that might encourage young people to go into missions or go into the ministry. And so they brought to me a check, and it was a fairly substantial check, and said, somehow we want to use this to be able to encourage and support young people who want to go into missions or ministry. And so we figure out a way to do that. We sent some young people who were interested on some mission trips. Uh, one couple went on an international mission trip. Uh, we used the money in various ways exactly for that purpose. And, and in a sense, that's kind of what is going on in this morning's scripture passage. These are not instructions for uh, specific offerings that might be made throughout the year, specific sacrifices, uh, like on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, or otherwise, but rather they're offerings that someone would bring in gratitude uh, to God, maybe in, in uh, uh, asking God to atone for their sins. That's in this, this passage. Uh, but, but not something that's required by law, but something that people would just decide they wanted to do in uh, mostly in gratitude to God. And by Leviticus 3, we do get this idea of a sacrifice of well-being is, is what more modern translations say. But, but in the uh, former translations, almost a better is a thank offering. You bring this sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. Well, let's think a little bit about what is going on here, both in Leviticus uh, in general and in this passage in particular. Uh, there's a wonderful tongue-in-cheek, uh, but nevertheless uh, biblically accurate book I have called Crazy Book, A Not-So-Stuffy Dictionary of Biblical Terms. And it describes Leviticus as the do-it-yourself book of the Old Testament if it says by do-it-yourself you mean do it right or you'll need to make uh, sin offerings. So here's a list of things to help you get it right. Uh, and, uh, and that really is. This is how you're going to make this thank offering so that you get it right, so you don't mess up and actually commit a sin in the process. Uh, the New International Version Learning Bible calls Leviticus a how-to manual for priests, for the Levites. And that's actually where the book of Leviticus gets its name. Uh, the Levites are the priestly class. And so Leviticus is the how-to manual for the Levites. Now, um, Leviticus is kind of a tough book for us because uh, sometimes people cherry pick a verse or two out of there to make a point that actually isn't um, necessarily uh, contingent upon us or doesn't have uh, uh, the power of law over us. 
Uh, you may have heard somebody say, well, if you get a tattoo, that's, that's a violation, that's a sin. Well, that comes out of Leviticus. Uh, but, it, but as Paul would say, if you're going to keep one piece of the law, you have to keep all of the law. And so if we're going to use Leviticus in that manner, you need to know that if you have any blemish on your skin, and particularly if you have some kind of a skin disease, uh, Leviticus says you need to come to the priest and show it to the priest, and the priest will decide whether or not you're clean or not, and the priest will tell you what you need to do to take care of this skin disease. So if you have a skin disease, I suppose by implication, you've got to come to me and let me take a look at it, and I'll decide if you're clean or not, if you're sinful or not, yeah, what you need to do to atone for your sin. But let me tell you, I'd rather you didn't do that. <laughs> if you have a sin, uh, a, a problem with uh, your skin, then please go to your doctor. Uh, that's a much better person to go to than me to try to see what you need to do about that. And I say that to say, as Christians, we need to be careful with the book of Leviticus. We cannot read it uh, literally just flat-footed. We also can't say, well, I like this verse. I'm going to use this verse. This verse doesn't seem to apply to me. I'm not going to use this verse. But we need to recognize that everything in the book is written to the community, uh, and it does have something to say to us, but it's going to take some interpretation and some application. And you may already be wondering, well, how in the world are all of these weird uh, instructions about how to make a sacrificial offering to God of livestock, how is that possibly going to be able to, to tell us anything for today? And I'll admit, I kind of wondered that myself when I started studying this. And then I find that actually uh, this is a wonderful, uh, does have some wonderful stuff for us that I think can really help us in, in our worship lives, both as individuals and as a community. All the detailed instructions that God gives in the passage that I read there in Leviticus 1 are there for specific reasons. Uh, and as already mentioned, the offering there is an occasional offering, and it's being brought as a burnt offering. Now, in Hebrew, the word burnt for, for burnt is ola, and it's actually where we get our word holocaust, a complete consummation the, the offering is completely burned up and that's different from say the passover offering at passover you would bring a lamb uh, it would be uh, sacrificed offered uh, to god but some of the meat would be returned to you to use in the passover dinner uh, that evening with your family this is not that kind of offering the entire offering is going to be burnt on the offering plate on the on the offering altar well, the giver, as is instructed, brings the animal to the entrance of that enclosure that goes around the tabernacle. And one of the priests would meet you there at the entrance. The door up would be open. Uh, you might be able to come into the entrance, at least in that day and age, if you were a male. And it says that the giver would place his hand on the head of the animal. And partly this is conveying ownership, and it's almost like giving ownership now over to God. It also is a way of placing your sins on that animal. And so when it is sacrificed, as it says there in Leviticus 1, it is an atonement uh, for you. The animal takes uh, your sins upon them. Now, God stipulates that if you're going to make a burnt offering, that you're to bring a male animal. And some of you women uh, may think may say, well, that's rather sexist. Why not a female animal? Uh, remember what's going to happen to this animal. And so, at least in that sense, it's not sexist. But actually, what is likely going on here is that female animals, female livestock, are much more valuable than male livestock. Uh, you, you can have as many cows as possible. That's a good thing. They give milk. They can give birth. Uh, but you don't need that many bulls. The bull's only job is to get the cows pregnant. Uh, and then after that, they don't really have any other use except to be eaten for, for meat. And so God really is, in a sense, saying here, I want you to make an offering to me. And when you make an offering to me, uh, it needs to be a sacrifice uh, of yours. But it doesn't have to be a sacrifice that's going to impinge on your family, uh, maybe any more than necessary, you might almost say. And so you can use a male instead of a female for this. And the... Uh, um, passage continues. I didn't read all of the first chapter, but, but maybe you're not bringing a male bull. Maybe you're bringing a male sheep or a male goat. Maybe you're bringing uh, pigeons or turtle doves, or maybe you're bringing a grain offering. And there's a sense in which no matter what it is, no matter how great a sacrifice you're making, uh, God has specific requirements for all of them. And I really like what John Golden Gay, the Old Testament scholar, said about the pigeon's 
or the turtle doves. Those would not likely be animals that, that they would be raising and keeping domesticated. They would actually have to go out there and harvest them somehow to, to set a trap or however you would, you would be able to, to catch these animals and you would need to catch them live, but catch the pigeons or the turtle doves and then bring them in. But that's no less a sacrifice because we are making a thank offering, saying, God, I, I, I love you and I thank you. And Golden Gay said, this is kind of like bringing someone a bouquet of wild flowers that you picked. You may not have had to pay anything for them. You maybe didn't raise them. They didn't come out of your garden. And yet, nevertheless, a person would be very pleased to receive a beautiful bouquet of wildflowers that you had taken the time to pick and to arrange and to bring to them. Uh, same kind of a, a thing here. God is clear, however, that the animal needs to be uh, completely without blemish. And even the pigeons or the turtle doves need to be without blemish. And, and here is, there are standards here. It has to be a true sacrifice. So we don't make offerings to God in the same way that we might clean out our house and find a clothes that we can't wear anymore. Maybe they're slightly stained or we don't fit us anymore or we just had them for a while and they're faded. And so we take them to a thrift shop so that they can sell them so someone else can use them. This isn't what we're doing in making a sacrifice to God. That's not good enough. Um, if I want to thank you for something that you have done for me, and I want to offer you gratitude, and I give you an old t-shirt of mine that's faded and maybe stained and doesn't fit me anymore, uh, you're not going to find that as a wonderful gift that I'm giving you, a thank you gift. It may even insult you, and it probably should insult you. Uh, likewise, when uh, we make a gift to God, it needs to be, it can be a male, it doesn't have to be a female, but it needs to be without blemish. It needs to be costing you something. And of course, in that day and age, it would also be costing them meat. Uh, they wouldn't have eaten meat that often. And so by giving even the male, they are giving God something that they could have used and could have been a wonderful thing that they used. But they say to God, I love you this much. I want you to have this. Well, when the priests slaughter the animal, there's all these uh, detailed instructions for how that happens. And the first thing they do is they're to splash the animal's blood on the altar. And that may sound rather uh, violent, uh, rather gross, uh, but what they're doing is remember for the ancients, blood was almost literally life. And so when blood pours out, that is life. And so they're giving the life of this animal to uh, the, the um uh, to God. Uh, when Jesus says, my blood is shed for you, he's giving his life to us uh, so that we might have life as well. So this is very much a way of giving the life of the animal to, uh, to God. That's also why in the Hebrew uh, rituals for slaughtering meat that you're going to eat, you have to let it completely bleed out. There can't be any blood in it because the life is God's, but then we're able to use the meat in that sense. Of course, not in, in this sense. And then the entrails and the legs are carefully washed. Why is that? That is simply to eradicate them of any fecal matter because we don't want to be offering that to God for, for obvious reasons. And then finally, as we mentioned before, the animal is burned completely on the altar and the smoke rises to God as a pleasing odor. I don't know if you can tell, let's say it may have, could I, I tried to get my grill going a little bit here in the background so there might be some smoke coming up uh, through my grill. If you've ever been to a backyard barbecue, you know just how pleasing uh, that aroma is. Uh, for those of us who love a really good grilled steak, there's almost no better uh, aroma than we can smell. And when the grill is going and you can smell that aroma, your mouth just starts to water. And so this shows the one who has made the sacrifice really has made a true sacrifice. They're not going to eat this meat. They're giving it to God, not because God needs it, not because God is going to eat it, but, but because they love God that much. And it is a pleasing aroma to the Lord, but it's important, I think, to recognize it's a pleasing aroma to us as well. And as even if they are outside of the tent, maybe the women outside of the enclosure there, and the men who are there inside around the altar, as they're smelling this thing, it is pleasing to all. And it's a way of saying how thankful I am uh, to you, God, uh, that, that I can give this to you. And smelling that aroma and knowing that I'm giving it to you as a sacrifice uh, is just a wonderful expression of our love. Well, let's dig a little deeper, compare Scripture to Scripture. A Leviticus is quoted in the New Testament over a hundred times, believe it or not. And although a lot of its instructions and its practices and its laws aren't applicable to us today, the intentions behind them are, and they are for individuals, but even more so Leviticus, just like the New Testament, is a book written to the whole community. 
You know, the entire New Testament is written either to churches or it's written to individuals in churches for how they are to respond or regard to their church. So think about the book of Philemon. It's written to Onesimus about his runaway slave, but Paul says invite him back, not as a slave, not as a servant, but as a brother in Christ in the church that is in your house. And so Leviticus reminds us that our faith is communal. There really are no Lone Ranger Christians. And so once uh, collected in our churches, we often take up an, an offering uh, as a part of our service. Uh, and that is a part of the service of worship. We worship through giving our, our, our offerings. And oftentimes what happens, of course, is uh, whoever's taking up the offering brings it back down front, often holds it aloft as the pastor or someone pray, prays a prayer of blessing over the altar. And then oftentimes the, altar, uh, the, the, uh, the offering is literally placed on the altar table. Uh, we're not going to burn the money, but hopefully we are going to use the money completely for the glory of God. And that's the whole purpose of that. And it really comes right out of the book of Leviticus. Now, the scripture that just naturally occurs to me uh, when we are thinking about making an offering to God is when Paul tells us that each of you must give as you've made up your mind, not regretfully or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's exactly the intention of Leviticus 1. Yes, we are bringing a sacrificial offering to God, but not because we feel compelled to do so, and not because we've been manipulated to do so, uh, not because um, we are regretting something, but we do it because we're so thankful for the forgiveness, for the blessings, for all the things that God offers to us. And so we bring back something of that to God, bringing them out of gratitude. You may remember in Luke 2, Mary and Joseph bring a pair of turtle doves to the temple as a part of the purification rituals for Mary after Jesus is born. And this is just eight days after the, he is born. And uh, although this was in fulfillment of purification laws, uh, the process is essentially the same. And it is very important that we note that Mary and Joseph bring turtle doves. What does this tell us? Well, this tells us that they were very poor, that they didn't have a sheep or a goat or an, an, an ox or, or a bull uh, to bring for a sacrifice. They had to bring two turtle doves. Uh, this also, by the way, suggests they probably did not have a donkey they could have ridden on either. Uh, they probably had to walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and eventually they would walk from Bethlehem to Egypt. This was a poor couple. And yet it's a wonderful example how God doesn't require equal gifts. God requires equal sacrifice. And so they had to give out of what they had. And it may not have been an equal gift, but it was an equal sacrifice. Someone else who is much more wealthy, they shouldn't bring two turtle doves. They should bring a bull because that is an equal sacrifice. Again, not an equal gift, but an equal sacrifice sacrifice. And that, of course, uh, brings to mind the story of Jesus who is watching the people come into the temple and making their offerings. And as they do, he praises the widow who puts in everything she has, although it's just two tiny coins, just two mites, worth next to nothing. But it was all that she has. And so he says she's given more than anyone else. Her sacrifice was greater than anyone else. And this is a reminder both in Leviticus and in these passages that we are called to do the same. Well, let's think a little bit about the history of the church and the witness of the church. And before we get to the church, let's think about the witness of the temple. And so this practice begins in the wilderness uh, in Leviticus. They are to bring the, the uh, uh, offering to the, the door of the enclosure or the, the tent flap almost, the flap, open up the enclosure, let the animal come in. Then it's sacrificed on the altar right there in front of uh, the tent there that contained the Ark of the Covenant, but later we are in the temple, and the temple serves the same pro uh, same purposes. And yet we know that by the time of Jesus, much of those purposes have been corrupted. And now they were used as money-making schemes for the temple and for others who were connected to the temple. And so Jesus comes in and overturns the money changer's table, and money goes flying everywhere. And he drives both them and all the animals they had out of of the temple and, and the practice then was if you brought an animal they would judge it with a blemish and then they would sell you an animal that they claimed did not have a blemish and they were not trying to uh, uh, fulfill the law that God gave they were just trying to line their pockets or line the pockets of the temple we know that also happened in church history and part of the reason that the Protestant Reformation happened 
was that the church was selling indulgences and saying, if you want your loved ones to be able to be freed from purgatory, you give us money and you give us money and then your, your, your uh, relative will be freed from purgatory. And so when the, the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, they said. Well, that's the church just manipulating people and enriching themselves so that they could build uh, the, the, the church in Rome. And although we do want to ask people to make contributions when we're in a building program, or when there is some special need, we can't do it out of manipulations. And so the aroma that at one time was pleasing to God uh, now in this manipulative way becomes something that just stinks to high heaven, uh, we might say. Well, I grew up just a few miles uh, away from Jim Baker's PTL uh, a Heritage USA complex. And from an early age, I learned and I knew from kind of watching what was going on over there the excesses of a religious system that is much more interested in its own wealth than it is in God. And as a pastor, even to this day, I often get marketing uh, things coming to me, promising to help with stewardship, promising to help with any uh, uh, fundraising program we might have. And they promise that, that, that if you use their methods, that you can raise more money than you even need through these patented uh, fundraising uh, methods and techniques. And some of them are very good, and some of them are to help people recognize that out of gratitude to God, we ought to give to the church, and it helps them increase their gratitude and perhaps therefore increase their giving. But some of them are nothing more than manipulative ways to separate people from their money, and that is not what the book of Leviticus, not what Leviticus 1 is encouraging us to do at all. And so in some ways, church history has a lot of ways where we should be ashamed of what we have done. And yet, in spite of all of the excesses and in spite of all of the abuses, there is a long, long history of God's people sacrificing out of gratitude with the intention of bringing glory to God, not with the intention of getting the church uh, to be more wealthy than it needs to be or to lining the pocket of someone or to getting some kind of goodies for themselves, but simply to bring glory to God out of their gratitude. I mentioned that story at the beginning of the couple in my church from some time ago who did that. Uh, my guess is all of us from time to time have given to the church have given to some wonderful cause because of the gratitude that we have for God and we want to do something that will bring glory to God. That often happens at the Christmas season when we are so thankful for the coming of the Christ child and, and out of that gratitude we're led to give additional offerings to the church or give to uh, some uh, cause that will help other people who are less fortunate. Uh, that's what uh, church history has much, much more than the excessives and that is the true history and the true legacy of the church. Well, let's think just really briefly in, in closing, how, how might we apply this scripture uh, in our community and in our own lives? David Steindl Rast is a Benedictine monk, and uh, he was born in 1926, so he's getting way, way up in years. But he has dedicated his life to uh, helping people recognize how important gratitude is. Gratitude towards God, gratitude towards one another. And his work is basically summed up in a single sentence that he says over and over. And that is, happy people are not grateful, but grateful people are happy. And so if you want to be happy, he's saying you don't say, well, I'll be happy once I'm grateful. Once I have enough good stuff, then I'll be grateful and then I'll be happy. No, no, no. We have to be grateful for what we have now. And then that tends to bring happiness bubbling up in us. And I think that's part of what God is trying to teach us in this passage as well. The aroma of that burnt offering was pleasing to God, but it also would be pleasing to any who were around. I make the sacrifice of gratitude and then I receive that wonderful, pleasing aroma of happiness, of joy. And so when we give to God, whether it's our money or our energy or our time or our attention, if we're giving to God out of gratitude, we're going to benefit as well. And so all of those specific instructions that God gives in Leviticus 1 and throughout the rest of Leviticus isn't to try to make us jump through a bunch of hoops so that God can see if we jump through those hoops, but it's to help us be able to get ourselves in the proper attitude. So I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm going to make the biggest sacrifice I can. That might be a cow. It might be a sheep. It might be a turtle dove. It might be a grain offering. But when I do, I'm also going to make, that, make sure that it is without blemish. It's the best I have that I'm truly making a sacrifice. And when I make that sacrifice and I give it all to God unreservedly, I'm going to find that out of my gratitude, God also fills me with joy. The aroma is pleasing to God, but it also will be pleasing to me. 
Paul tells us, quoting Jesus, and it's the only place in the Bible it's quoted. It's not in the Gospels, but we know that Jesus said it because Paul tells us that he did, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And it is because this passage in Leviticus 1 and what we've learned from that that we recognize how true that is. Imagine, if you will, uh, you uh, pick out a very special gift for a very special person. And it may be for them on Christmas or for their birthday, but it's even better if it's for some occasion that isn't Christmas or birthday. But you just see something and you want to give to them and you make a sacrifice in order to give this to them. And you just cannot wait to give it. And they're going to be so excited when they open up this gift or they see this gift or, or whatever. Uh, and you just can't wait to see uh, that. And there's all kinds of enjoyment just in the anticipation. And then you give them the gift and they are so excited and they are so thankful uh, for your gift and it cements your relationship it continues the bond well that is what is going on in Leviticus we give to God an occasional offering on top of our regular offerings simply out of gratitude and giving to God out of gratitude we find ourselves enriched even as that aroma of the sacrifice we've made is pleasing to God as well and so let us find ways that, that we can do that uh, regularly so that we can be the people that God is calling us to be and have the relationship with God that we all want to have. Indeed, this is the word of God for the people of God. And in spite of how strange it is, thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.